Ever since I began this channel more than five years ago, I've explored the curious relationship between professional wrestling and organized religion. There have been some bad examples, there have been some good ex Okay, there's been mostly bad examples, but even in the worst cases, there are still some things about them that redeem them? Huh? This week, I look at The Masked Saint, which came out in 2016, a movie that's advertised as being based on true events. The movie, no, get out! The most Christian wrestling film since Sting Moment of Truth, this film won't insult your intelligence with match breaks that totally clash the story's timeline. It will, however, offer up a paper-thin story of a wrestler turned pastor turned wrestler again who has to save his new church while also convincing his community that maybe God ain't so bad after all. It's Nacho Libre meets Dangerous Minds. Let's dive right in. We begin the movie in sepia, the most dramatic of tones. In a flashback, we meet our protagonist, Chris Samuels. At the age of seven, he sees his deadbeat father abandon his family. You'd think it'd be a major plot point. But that's really not important to the story. Chris spends most of his time at school getting bullied, a common occurrence amongst downtrodden children in film. He ends up finding solace in professional wrestling, specifically the WFW. Still a better name than Woof. There's an arm twist, elbow knock, and the beast gets him into a neck hole. Oh, the gladiator does his drop to a hole. This is one of the most devastating submission moves. Legs can be broken this way. Boy, the announcer is really excited about these basic moves. If you showed him a phoenix splash, his head would explode. Despite a very specific warning from the announcer. Kids, don't try this at home. Chris pretty much does just that, as he fights back against the bully on the playground and makes him tap out to a drop. Toehold? Oh boy, I can already tell this movie's gonna have tons of in-ring thrills. The movie jumps ahead to the present day, where Chris, now working for the WFW, performs under a mask as the Saint. Get a load of that sweet replica belt with the big plastic plates on it. Well, you gotta save your money somewhere. How else are they gonna afford that sweet pyro? We meet promoter Nikki Stone, played by Roddy Piper, in what would be his final film role. And what a final role it was, too. Who better to play a sleazy promoter than a guy who spent the last half of his life openly bashing sleazy promoters? We also see a wrestler named Iceman Cometh. No, not just the Iceman, he's the Iceman Cometh. Guess they had to throw a Bible reference in somewhere. Fun fact, the guy who plays Mr. Cometh is RJ City, a wrestler who also played the werewolf in Monster Brawl, but is better known more recently as the guy who ate a diamond cutter from David Arquette. You know, just for the record, I won, so maybe put that a little asterisk at the bottom of your video, okay? I beat David Arquette. It's revealed that tonight is Chris's final match, win, lose, or draw, as he plans to retire from wrestling to become a pastor. Kayfabe means nothing in this world as his wife and daughter, Michelle and Carrie, just barge into the locker room to wish him good luck and nobody bats an eye. The Saint has a tall, incredibly symbolic task ahead of him as he defends his title against newcomer, the Reaper. Sometimes, the bad guy's gotta win. The Saint's able to hold his own against the Reaper, who apparently has gone into shoot mode early on. I guess Chris must have missed the signal where his opponent rubbed his head. Well, you see, take my hand, I rub my chrome dome like this. After hitting his stunner-esque finisher called the Faith Breaker, the Saint does a little too much grandstanding and hot-dogging as he gets cut off by the Reaper. No, 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 no! You know what I just noticed? Those two aren't sweating a drop in there. Man, those guys are pros. After we see a wide shot of the crowd, most of which had to have been added in post, we jump ahead to see Chris and his family get ready to move to their new life out of state. You ready for Westside Baptist? I'm ready for the church. I don't know if I'm ready for Michigan. Take him to Detroit. No! No, not Detroit! No! The family and their dog, whose name is Piper, in a film that stars a guy named Piper, drives across four states to reach the meanest, nastiest, most dangerous city imaginable, Rolling Spring, Michigan. The Samuels finally arrive at the church to meet its meager staff, including the choir director, who leads a group full of Jillian Halls. Chris then meets the guy who you think's gonna be the baddie in this picture, Judd Lumpkin, the head of the board of directors and the church's number one donor. He also happens to be a massive douche, but you could already guess that since he's wearing MJF's scarf. 
I hope you like the sound of screeching cats, because that's our choir. They give a whole new meaning to make a joyful noise to the Lord. I saw your daughter in the parking lot. That little rat needs to be in a leash. God gave us the Bible and basketballs, huh? One of the perks of being me. <laughs> Judd's played by Patrick McKenna, probably best known for his work as Harold from the Red Green Show. And yes, I was shocked as many of you probably are when I realized that too. After putting up with Judd's self-aggrandizing talk for several minutes, Chris and family meet up with Miss Edna. She's played by Diane Carroll, who, along with Roddy Piper, has helped this movie meet its celebrity quota in order to qualify as a Tier 1 Christian film. Miss Edna is the heart of the church, the group's moral and spiritual compass, and basically fills the role of the film's magical knee. You know, I probably shouldn't say that word, even in this context of a review. So, um, Ian, can you help me out, please? Magical Negro. Thank you. Edna explains to Chris that the congregation is shrinking because nobody likes Judd's egotistical attitude. Maybe Judd needs an attitude adjustment. Chris and Michelle introduce themselves to the neighborhood, but it turns out this town's full of nothing but miserable, godless heathens who slam the door in their faces. It's only the final house they visit where they're allowed in. They talk to Mindy for a while and notice she's been abused, right as the abusive husband walks in, and he doesn't like company over when there's an abusing a going on, y'all. You don't come around here no more. No one wants what you're selling. Look at all these assholes. Man, by the end of the film, when everyone gets redeemed, it's gonna feel so good, everyone. It's time for Chris's first sermon, and he sucked diddly ox, Flanders. Faith. Yes, faith. You see, um, faith is, um, faith is what gets us through. Faith is good. As the montage shows us, this goes on for weeks, which totally blows my mind. You're telling me that this character, a former professional wrestler, has stage fright? I get that it's his first day on the job, but he's been working in front of far less forgiving crowds in the ring for years before this. Are you telling me he never had to cut a promo while he was a champion? There's a lot of faithless people out there. They need to be more faithful. So today, we're talking about faith. Again. Let's face facts. There's only one man who can deliver a clear, concise message about this topic. Cause I gotta have faith. Because Chris is so bad at this for some reason, the church keeps losing members. The troubles continue to mount for Chris during a wreck basketball game between the church crew and police officers. Judd makes an ass out of himself with his bombast and gets the whole team kicked out of the league. He swings at Chris, whose instincts kick in. Judd, the more you struggle, the more it's gonna hurt. Oh, Judd, remember what you learned at Possum Lodge? Quando Omni Flunkus Moritati! A humiliated Judd pulls his funding from the church in retaliation. The Samuels are also kicked out of the rental home that Judd owned, forcing them to move into the bad part of town, right next door to Mindy and the abusive guy. Things seem bad until Miss Edna takes Chris to a WFW house show nearby. See, back at the basketball game, she somehow figured out that Chris used to be the saint, because I guess there's only one man who could deliver a sleeper like that. And since she knows who the saint is, wouldn't she know the last place he probably wants to be is at a show for the company that ran him out? He commands this entire room. I thought it was just because he slammed the other guy into the canvas. I mean, the audience, they just, they just want blood and violence. You were a wrestler for the longest time, and you don't understand why people like wrestling? Who are you? Chris discovers that in his absence, the Reaper has become the biggest baby face in the company. Hey, even if you don't like him, you gotta respect him! Well, that's what the WFW would like to be the case if that familiar line's any indication. And a faith breaker! Iceman's little nod to his old friend the saint! Dude, I'd be pissed. He took Chris's old finisher and turned it into a throwaway move. The Reaper tries to taketh the Iceman out of wrestling, but apparently Chris found a nearby phone booth to change into, so he could storm the ring as the Saint and save the day. So is this a work or a shoot then? Nikki is not at all pissed about his former employee interrupting the match, and even offers him 20,000 smackers to face the Reaper one more time. <laughs> Betcha that never comes up again. On his way home after dropping off Miss Edna, Chris witnesses one of the local hoes praying when she's confronted by her pimp. You better be praying, because I told you, stop disrespecting me. Jojo, I just... <laughs> oh man, this movie's really souring my stance on pimping. The Godfather always made it look so fun. But Jojo the Pimp is stopped by a wrestling vigilante. Leave her alone. Who the hell are you supposed to be, man? Macho Libre? I said... Leave her alone. Say everything twice! Yeah! Say every 
everything twice. Ooh, yeah! <laughs> Chris beats up the pimp and rescues the prostitute, answering her prayers. Thank you, you're a saint. No, miss. I'm just a man. In a minivan. Chris finally makes it home to discover that his wife was taken to the hospital, I'm sorry, the local medical facility, after falling and hitting her head. Chris rushes over and gets some shocking news. I'm gonna be a big sister. <laughs> what? <laughs> oh, uh, wow, well, good for them. That's great. Uh, there's probably less needlessly dramatic ways for us to reach this plot point, but uh, Mazel Tov. With the church's financial problems mounting, Chris leads a sermon where he looks to the community for answers. Who here works for a bank? Well, I'm with the IRS. That counts. That counts. Um, I think the IRS is the opposite of a bank. Valerie, the whore from before, comes to the church service and right away is given dirty looks by the congregation. Was this town so small that everyone knows who the hookers are around here? But Chris does the Christian thing and urges his flock to welcome Val with open arms as the church slowly begins to strengthen. Back at home, Michelle urges Chris to get back into the ring to help pay the bills. The wrestling? Where in the Bible does it say thou shalt not wrestle, huh? Wait, doesn't it though? Wrestling is ungodliness, yo. So Chris returns to wrestling in secret, getting some of that sweet part-timer cash to help ease the church's financial burden. In this montage, we see the saint breaking the faiths of many jobbers, all while the church and the community get stronger together. Not to mention a few shots of the Reaper just standing there looking mean. Come on, people. Now we've reached act two of this picture, the very, very quick downward spiral. Suddenly, Chris is very full of himself and has taken all the credit for the church's success. He even shit cans the old choir director right in front of everybody. If you don't mind, I'm wondering if Ashley and I could join your church. Only if you become a new choir director. What's he on about? Chris's descent into madness continues at a breakneck pace as he begins taking his frustrations out in his family and even yells at Ray, the abusive guy next door. Only in that case, it seems to work because by the end of the movie, things turn around for Ray. So, one out of three ain't bad. After no showing an event, Chris stops at a diner that happens to be getting robbed. He dons the saint mask and breaks up the robbery, which catches the attention of a police detective we met during the basketball scene. The detective, who really wants to be Tay Diggs, tries to pin Chris for the recent vigilante work, including getting him to stand in a police lineup to try and arrest him in front of his own freaking daughter. Luckily for Chris, the waitress from the diner bails him out. None of the men are the guy. You're not even really looking at him. None of the men are the guy. Chris and Carrie get to the church to discover that it's been vandalized. Realizing that he's responsible for what's happened, he reveals his double life to Michelle, or I guess in this case, his triple life. Michelle, who is showing absolutely zero signs of pregnancy by this point, storms off. Later, a humbled Chris holds a sermon where he takes responsibility for his actions that caused the church to become a target. And he also admits he's been wrestling, which has been kept secret from the congregation. See, I thought wrestling would solve our financial woes. You know, that misconception comes up an awful lot for some reason. Look at the graffiti. These are gang symbols, and the thug that did this is still out there. Really? The graffiti is all gang symbols? That's odd. I've never heard of the Get Out Gang, the Go Homes, or the Rolling Spring Squigglies. So now that Chris has come clean and bore his soul to the church, surely his congregation will do the Christian thing and show him patience and forgiveness. For that, I'm truly sorry. Well, that's not good enough. He lied to us. He should be fired for what he's done. Well, maybe it's time he stepped down then. Yeah, or that. But then our old pal Judd Lumpkin comes back to the church to vouch for the pastor, and they're both given a second chance. Chris tries to talk Nikki into coming back to wrestle the Reaper for the $20,000. Fair fight. <laughs> There hasn't been a fair fight in pro wrestling since the 70s. Well, of course he would say that. He may or may not have initiated a screw job at his own champion and also saw an impromptu handicap match break out on his own show involving a non-contracted wrestler. Nikki balks at the Saints' request, bringing up the no-show from earlier, when Chris plays the ace up his sleeve. You're gonna do body slam me? No, but we are here to audit you. I'm Lauren Vander Brown from the Internal Revenue Service. Well, it only took 24 years, but it looks like IRS finally got his revenge on Roddy Piper. Backstage before the match, Jojo the Pimp, who's also the one responsible for the vandalism earlier, confronts Chris with a gun. Makes you wonder why he didn't just pull that out in their first encounter. But in walks Ray, the reformed domestic abuser who cold cocks double Joe with a dumbbell from behind, all while keeping hold of his soda. Priorities. 
In walks Detective Diggs, who comes to take JoJo away and also lets Chris off the hook for good measure. What about uh, quitting while I'm ahead? Well, sometimes you gotta go all in. Oh shit, guys, next Bullet Club member confirmed! It's time for the main event, a literal battle of good versus evil. Chris is unmasked for the first time and goes by his real name. And we even get a brief cameo from Chris Whaley, the real masked saint whose story this film was based on. You got him, saint. Yes, it's an emotional high point in the story as viewers prepare for an explosive battle in the steel cage. Then the bell rings. I mean, it's not a bad match, it's just a little confusing. There's no referee in this thing, but the Saint rolls Reaper up for a pinfall anyway. But if pinfalls count, then Chris should have lost since his shoulders were down for the entirety of this armbar he caught the guy with. Chris makes the Reaper tap and is triumphant, proving that no matter what, God always ends up getting his heat back. Well, hang on, Reaper gets to keep the belt? What a rip! You know, the Christian wrestling film genre is surprisingly small. I think I've seen most of the entries by now, and so after some consideration, I think The Masked Saint ranks right up there near the top of the category, but still lower than Nacho Libre. Man, I was way too harsh on that movie. The story of The Masked Saint is a very simple one, bordering on cliché, and while it doesn't really need to be more than that, it sure would be nice if it were. At times, the movie jumps from family romp to serious life-and-death conflict with very blunt transitions. The arc of Chris's journey seems to skip several steps near the middle of the film, and I think his redemption after his fall from grace comes a little too quickly and he barely has to work for it. It's hard to screw up a battle of light versus darkness using wrestling as a framing device, but much like what Ring of Glory did years earlier, somehow they were still able to hit some snags. My biggest gripe to the parts where Pastor Chris is nervous on the pulpit early on, or when he thinks that wrestling fans just enjoy seeing violence. Now you could excuse those as very meta, very inside baseball critiques, but considering the audience are shooting for with this movie, those things could be brought up by other fans as well. They're issues that wrestling veterans shouldn't have a hard time grasping, but are cast aside for the sake of creating plot points and character development. The layperson might not notice these things, and it works on that level, but it does fly in the face of what one would expect most most wrestlers to know. That being said, the acting is okay, and even though the wrestling itself was nothing special, at least they made it look pretty. Ronnie Piper was serviceable in his role as Nikki the promoter, but I think he pulled his punches a bit in terms of being a shrewd businessman with no scruples. That could be an issue with the script, however, and not so much as acting. And even if this may not go down as the greatest Christian film of all time, its core message of being nicer to each other can resonate with viewers of any kind. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.